Hi, I'm Alex Grieve, aka IB Crazy, and this is How to Be Successful in FPV Part 9, Radio Communication Explained. Unlike just about every other facet of RC, FPV with a video system is very much so focused on radio communication. It's very critical that it happens properly because unlike RC where you're simply telling the aircraft or car or helicopter what to do, with FPV, it's also having to transmit back to you. And the problem is, is now you have competing frequencies and sometimes in very close proximity. So in this segment, I'm going to explain to you not only how to read a radiation plot, what's a Fresnel zone, what's multipathing interference, what's noise floor, but also where to place your antennas, how to aim them, and how they work. The first part that you need to understand is how to read a basic radiation plot. You'll hear about directional antennas and they are out in front. Does that mean they only listen out in front? No. For example, we're gonna take the pepper box, a 13 dBIC long range directional antenna, and I'm going to compare it to an Omni many of you are familiar with, the Cloverleaf. Both right hand circularly polarized, but very different in performance. This thing on a receiver might get you two miles or so. This one is gonna get you closer to 35. Why? Well, it's all in the radiation plot. These are basic radiation plots. On your left, you see the radiation plot of the pepper box. On the right is the clover leaf. The antenna position is dead center in the middle of the cross. Well, at first glance, you could tell the pepper box reaches out a lot further in one direction, but not very well in the other. But it appears if you look at the clover leaf, like the clover leaf has better coverage. Well, it does, but look at the scales. Look very carefully. You'll see here that the clover leaf, the gain is about one and a quarter to one and a half dBi. That's this ring right here, but it covers all around you. Well, what about the, the pepper box? Well, there's that one, one dBi ring right there. Notice the pepper box reaches way out past that. So the pepper box is gonna reach out where the clover leaf stops here, the pepper box reaches way out front, a lot further. Here's the other thing. You can tell it doesn't listen nearly as well behind it. The clover leaf can listen behind itself all the way down here, where the pepper box can only listen so well right here. Now the great thing is, is if you have a signal somewhere behind yourself or behind the antenna, such as a reflected signal, the, you, the pepper box is only gonna receive it at this strength versus the clover leaf will receive it down here. So the great thing about a directional antenna, such as a pepper box, crosshair, helical, is not only do they listen out in front a lot stronger, but they also don't listen to reflected signals nearly as well. This is called the front to back ratio. It's the ratio of how well it listens in the front compared to how well it listens in the back. The higher the front to back ratio, the cleaner your video is out in front, but also the less distance you can fly behind it. So a highly directional antenna, you don't want to fly very far behind. But can you? Of course you can. Look again at your radiation plot. Can you fly behind the pepper box? Of course. Just don't go very far because obviously it's designed to listen out in front. But that doesn't mean you can't fly behind it and still be successful. So now that we've understood a little bit about radiation pattern, what makes one antenna different from the other, how do you set it up on your aircraft? This aircraft happens to be one of the most difficult to set up properly. Why? Multi-rotors have a transmitter and a receiver very close together and often have a carbon fiber or metal frame. What does that mean? Well, remember that this thing here is screaming video. As this gets further and further away, this over here is listening for control. So you wanna separate your receiver and your video transmitter as far as possible. In my case, I simply took the receiver and then backed the antenna out the back of the helicopter as far as I felt really comfortable with and moved my transmitter all the way to the front of the unit just to try to gain some kind of separation. Now, here's another thing you gotta understand. This helicopter is set up for low altitude. 
What do you mean, low altitude? What makes one setup different than another? Well, with this antenna on top, it sees just fine as long as it can see the antenna. But if I start going up, 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 my receiver is looking through the bottom of this frame, which is metallic. It also can't see through the battery. So the signal gets weak and you're violating the Fresnel zone simply by the frame of the vehicle. So if I'm going to go for high altitude, I'm gonna move this to a better location, such as underneath the helicopter. This way I can go for very, very, very high altitude and I see my antenna at all times without having to blast through this frame. Now my arms, of course the signal will go through the arms. Well, they won't go through that speed control very well. So when setting up your vehicle, consider where and how you'll be flying and make sure that your receiver and your transmitter antenna can see each other. Otherwise you'll violate the Fresnel zone with your own vehicle. Now, of course, the helicopter, especially the multi-copter, is difficult to set up. But what about an airplane? Flying wings have a very similar problem. And the, re the problem is, is that you don't have a whole lot of real estate on board the aircraft in which you mount components. Foam of the wing is RF transparent, which means this signal will pass right through the foam with no problem. Foam is mostly air. That's great. So that's one problem that exists on a multi-copter that doesn't exist on a foam airplane. But you still can't penetrate the battery that's in your battery bay or your camera or your transmitter very well. Real estate is still a bit crowded. So what do you do? Well, in my case, I put my receiver antenna out on the winglet and I also put my GPS receiver out on this wing and then I put my transmitter a little off center. Now, why not put it all the way on the wingtip? Well, the wingtip's a great place for the transmitter. The only problem is it makes the plane fly a little off balance, so I had to bring the transmitter in a little bit closer, but ideally, it would be all the way out here. The greater the separation, the cleaner the RF system. But why put the GPS close to your receiver antenna? Well, simple, this is a receiver antenna. It's not screaming like this is, it's listening just like the GPS. You can put as many receive antennas right on top of each other as you want, and they're not interfering with each other. Introduce a transmit, now you've got a problem. So try to get as much separation between your transmitting systems, such as your video transmitter, and oddly enough, your camera and your speed control can be considered a transmitting system because they emit a little bit of RF noise. And then of course, your GPS and your control receiver at a different location on the aircraft. Now granted, sometimes you gotta put it close, but understand when you put things closer, you're creating interference. Another thing that you wanna consider, and I see this a lot, is with these long range antennas, I don't see a whole lot of dipoles up there. Most people use a, what they call a monopole, a straight, straight up and down whip. Those do work, assuming you don't go for long range. They're not very efficient. If you're going for long range, Use a dipole. Make sure you have a ground plane, or as they call it, a counterpoise. Even if it's flexible, it'll stay fairly straight when the aircraft's in flight. When it lands, oh well, it folds up. Fold it down, you're fine. Even a coiled up ground plane is better than none at all. So yeah, the monopole's quick and easy and it works, but if you're starting to push the limits, make sure you use the proper dipole. Or you can also use the turnstile and just lay it flat to the bottom of the wing. So now you know a little bit about setting your aircraft up properly and the benefits of proper separation between components. But I mentioned a lot this thing, the Fresnel zone. What is the Fresnel zone? Well, basically what the Fresnel zone is, this transmit antenna has to see the receive antenna. As I said before, many things can block it. I had mentioned a helicopter, the physical frame, the battery, the camera, they all block the Fresnel zone. However, a lot of Fresnel zone violations are environmental. Say I'm flying this airplane all about the countryside and I see something off in the distance that I wanna go for. But what I didn't realize is on the way over, I had a building and when I went pa when I go past it, it's nice and clean, 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 clean. Dirty, 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 I can't hear you, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. Pop out the, until you pop out the other side and then it's clean again. Now that does not mean I have to fly necessarily this way behind it. What if I'm going for, say, distance? And I'm staying fairly low. 
Well, right now, it's not a problem to see that antenna. But as I get further and further and further away, guess what? Until I climb, all of a sudden this building is blocking that from seeing my receiver. So if you're going for distance and the video starts to break up, sometimes the easiest thing to do is punch the throttle and climb. Now it's clean. The building's down here, you're making your climb out. This doesn't mean you have to make long, long range flights at high altitude, but it's a good way to determine whether you've got a Fresnel zone violation just to hit the throttle and climb. Don't go too long because you could have another problem with say, multi-pathing or noise floor. Multi-pathing, what's that? Well, you might've heard me speak of multi-pathing in the antennas video, but we're gonna get a little bit more in depth here. Multi-pathing basically means you have multiple paths of signal can travel and still get received by your receiver antenna. So let's say, I'm, again, we're gonna fly out in the countryside, but let's say I pass by a building here. Well, the building isn't violating the Fresnel zone, it isn't between my airplane and my transmitter and receiver, it's over here. But the problem is, is objects reflect signals, especially high frequency signals. So while I've got a line of communication here, I've also got a line of communication off the building into my receiver antenna. Here's the problem. The reflected signal takes longer to get to the receiver because this distance is physically shorter than that distance. So what happens, the video begins to mix and scramble all over the place. Well, how do you fix that? Well, I just kind of illustrated it. Remember that this antenna listens much stronger out in front than it does behind it. So in the case I was flying out that way and the building is back here, well, the reflected signal from the airplane hits the building and enters the back of the antenna where the antenna really isn't listening. The airplane's still flying out there. Sure, you're getting multi-path interference, but the antenna doesn't hear it so well. However, if I had the antenna aimed this way at the building and I'm flying over here, guess what? That signal's coming back pretty strong. So directional antennas do help to minimize multi-pathing interference, but there's another tool, circular polarization. Now, I remember what I told you about circular polarization in an earlier video, that the signal rotates. And when the signal rotates and it bounces, the rotation effectively reverses. Now, if I've got a circularly polarized antenna set on both sides, this antenna only receives right hand, this antenna only transmits right hand, the bounce signal turned left hand. Because this antenna really only receives right hand, that bounce signal immediately gets rejected. With an omni antenna, with it's not circularly polarized, it bounces off that building and because there is no front or back, it simply enters the antenna. With circular polarization, it reverses rotation, hits the antenna and gets into the receiver very weakly. With a directionally circularly polarized antenna, you have the best of both worlds. You have both the front to back ratio, the antenna listening out in front, and you also have the signal rotation. So circular polarization is a tool to get around multipathing, but so is a directional antenna. Combine, the bo combine both of them and it works great. Now remember, with circular polarization, the advantage is having it on both ends. It's the only way it can work to reject multipath interference is if you have circularly polarized systems on both ends. There's one more thing to consider, and that's noise floor. What is noise floor? And how, how do I quantify it? Well, let's say you're in an open field and there's somebody next to you, you wanna to talk to them. Turn your head, talk, no problem. They can hear you just fine. You can probably even whisper. But what about in a crowded club or a bar with a music blasting or a rock concert. You can't just turn your head and talk to that person next to you. That doesn't work too well. Why? Because the noise floor is so loud, you need to scream in order to be heard. So with an FPV airplane, your transmitter's pretty weak. But if you're right on top of it, you can hear it just fine. But as you start to get further away, if the noise floor on your channel is very high, your signal will get weak very quickly because though this thing is still sitting there screaming, it's getting further away from you. So think that rock concert, if your friend starts walking away, 
and you're screaming eventually, actually it's not even gonna take that long before they can't hear you anymore. And that's essentially what's happening. The great thing is, is this only happens on certain frequencies. So if the noise floor is very high on every frequency except yours, you have no problem. If you have transmitters all around you screaming on 900 megahertz, 1.2 gigahertz, 5.8 gigahertz, but you're flying 2.4 gigahertz video, there's no problem. It doesn't matter how high the noise floor is that's not on your band. The problem is the noise floor that's on your band. If you're flying around a city, remember 2.4 gigahertz is Wi-Fi. So you see these horizontal bands of static coming across your screen. That could be noise floor. Most noise floor is digital these days and it appears to be banding. So let's say I'm gonna go out flying with a friend of mine and I want to fly, and he's on 2.4 gigahertz transmitter. The instant he flips on his transmitter, he increases the noise floor on 2.4 gigahertz. So I don't want to use 2.4 gigahertz for video. Well, what if that's all I have? Well, some 2.4 gigahertz transmitters now do 2.3 gigahertz. I hit the button, drop my video frequency down to 2305, and he's transmitting at 2400 to 2450. Well, I'm listening to 2305, so I'm okay. So sometimes the way around the noise floor is simply to change the channel. You know, I've had been shut down as short as 20 feet because I was flying near a cell phone tower. I hit the, hit the channel change button off of 2305 megahertz to 2396, and I was able to fly anywhere I wanted with no problems. However, let's say my friend's sitting there beside me on the, with that 2.4 gigahertz radio in that location. Well, 2305 megahertz is no good because that cell tower shut me down. 2396 megahertz is no good because it's too close to his 2.4 gigahertz radio. I can't use 2.3 or 2.4. I now have to choose 900, 1.2, 5.8. Basically, I have to completely change my entire video band to get around that noise floor problem. Okay, that's great. How do I identify this noise floor? Well, unless you have a spectrum analyzer, it's kind of difficult to identify the noise floor. But that doesn't mean it's impossible. In fact, your receiver can hear the noise floor. We already know this. So what if you shut off your aircraft? The receiver will only hear the noise floor. So one thing you can try to do is figure out where that transmitter is on your channel. If you suspect you're having noise floor problems and you want to know the source, one of the best things to do is simply take your receiver station, turn it on, pull your video goggles down with your aircraft off, pull the directional antenna, the more directional the better, pull it close to your body and spin around in a circle while watching the video feed in your goggles. What you're going to see is that the static in your goggles will change and you'll start to see that banding effect, assuming it's a digital signal, you'll see that banding effect. Well, guess what? Where you see that banding effect in that position from here to here? Well, I can bet that transmitter's right out there. So if I'm gonna fly on this band that has a high noise floor, I can use a directional antenna, point it this way, and go fly out here. Because the transmitter's back there and this antenna doesn't listen back here, it listens here. And I aim that out that way. So one way around the noise floor is to simply take your directional antenna and aim it in a different direction. Of course, generally the best solution is to simply change the channel or the band. But if that's not an option, maybe you just have to pick another flying location or pick flying out there instead of over there. This has been an IB Crazy tutorial. Keep your wings in the sky.